pull this together out of the ashes of what was the basis performance day in the short amount of time that you had is nothing short of remarkable. So I'm sure everybody out there is thanking you, Steve, um, and it's uh, probably testament to how hardworking you are. Um, so the presentation that I've got today is um, looking at the training process. Um, uh, Steve earlier kind of talked about uh, Aaron's uh, editorial from a few years ago about what a practitioner has to do quickly and what a researcher has to do slowly um, or ends up doing slowly. And I'm probably slightly on that slow side, um, trying to answer some questions that hopefully will in the near future or to some degree already has enabled practitioners to make maybe faster and more appropriate decisions. So in terms of what we'll cover today, we'll look at the training process um, and we'll look at some of the theory underpinning that and then I'll share with you some of the research that we've done and some of um, how it's potentially influenced practice. Uh, some of the research is published, other bits of it's unpublished, um, and there's a lot that we've got to publish yet, which will hopefully um, inform the practice in the near future. We're all aware of this model, or most people are. Um, I don't think anybody disagrees with this model. And Tanith um, alluded to it with the, uh, at the end of his talk where he had a preference for internal training load and that's ultimately become uh, ultimately because we believe that the internal training load will influence the training outcome and it's the training outcome that we as sports scientists, performance scientists and coaches are interested in. That internal training load is made up of the external training load, what's prescribed in terms of number of laps you might do, number of sprints you might do, the amount of distance you might cover and the individual's characteristics in terms of his fitness, fitness levels, genetics, so on and so forth. And traditionally, we used to look at this relationship between the training load and the training outcome using physiological assessment. So maybe we would test people every six weeks or so um, and then adapt our training program. Uh, however, more recent advances with some submaximal testing that could be done more, more often has kind of changed that. But we're still kind of reactive in reacting to the test. Um, through kind of all the research that we've done, of developed a three-step model to building an effective monitoring system. And that monitoring system, I think everybody has to go through these stages because um, we don't always have the resources to enact everything. And even if we do, it does take a bit of time. Um, first of all, we've got to react to the response. And that's what we've traditionally done in terms of looking at a test result, uh, looking at an injury, um, and then trying to adapt something. And then came the kind of explosion maybe 10 or 12 years ago of collecting training load, especially around the external training load. Um, training load with the heart rate and RP had been collected previously. So we have all of this information, but I guess this information is only useful if we really understand the relationship between uh, the amount of training somebody does or the training load that somebody does and the outcomes that we're interested in as practitioners and as coaches. So I think we've got to go through this process to become kind of reactive, uh, kind of, uh, from being reactive to becoming proactive. I'm not sure we're quite there yet with the proactive nature of things, but that's probably because the research is still catching up and, and we're not quite sure how, what that might look like uh, across all sports, across all scenarios. Um, I've covered some of this in a book chapter in Fitness in Soccer uh, that was published a few years ago. If anybody wants to read of that, it's on my research gate available for you. Um, we always ask questions and I guess the question that's always asked is who's asking the questions? Are there questions that we want to ask as sports scientists and performance scientists or is it the questions the coach is asking? Um, and this quote from Claude levi Strauss always sticks with me in terms of that he says a scientist is not a person who gives the right answers, he's the one who's asking the right questions. And we live in a society where everybody wants quick answers, quick answers. <laughs> Uh, to and maybe that's right because of the pressures people may face in the field uh, and practitioners may face. However, we do need to ask the correct questions and maybe it's not the same people that will be able to do that. Maybe the researchers who have a bit more time to sit back and think and philosophize have a chance to ask those questions and uh, therefore I don't think we should be too critical of practitioners in the field or having to make you know instant almost almost instant decisions. Um, Having said that, I do think there's probably a little more respect required for people who are working slowly to answer those questions too. And I see a lot more of that collaboration now taking place with a slightly more long-term view. Um, and you know, Steve's kind of probably one of the people that leads on that with the number of kind of integrated PhDs and master students he had when he was at home. 
So ultimately, the dose response relationship um, has been described as a fundamental principle of training. So whenever we look at any basic one-on-one physiology exercise, physiology text, this kind of sentence is always, always mentioned, and then there's nothing more. Um, and the questions we might often hear from coaches or performance scientists is questions such as, how much training is enough to maintain fitness? How much is required for improvement? What does a certain amount of training mean for performance on a given day? And what does that mean for, what does that certain dose of uh, training mean for recovery? And for me, these are all performance questions. And if anybody's asking these questions, they're actually effectively asking about the dose response relationship. Um, because so of the time limit, uh, it's only the first two that I'll be able to focus on for uh, purposes of today's presentation. But we have done quite a bit of work on the other two questions too, which I'm happy to share with people afterwards. Um, I guess the ultimate performance question from a coach's perspective is what an athlete's given performance capability is at a given time. They want to know on a Friday, on a, a before the game on a Saturday, um, what their potential capability is. And if they have that information, they can choose between 100% of Steve and 60% of Ronaldo. And if we can get that information across to them in some way, then they can make more informed decisions. And you can see some of the systems modeling that has probably given rise to this sort of approach uh, from the likes of Bannister. And the formula is fairly simple, where performance at any given time is a result of the fitness that somebody has, uh, minus the fatigue um, that they're displaying at the time. Uh, so these are the two components that we would really want to understand the dose response relationships for. What does the dose mean for fitness and what does that dose mean for fatigue? Uh, for the purpose of today's uh, presentation, I'll only be focusing on the fitness component, but we've done quite a bit of the work recently on the fatigue stuff as well, and maybe I'll put that up in a follow-up presentation somewhere. Um, from a sports scientist perspective, maybe the question that we're, we've got to ask ourselves is how can we reduce the training and monitoring errors to achieve the expected or planned outcomes? Um, and again, this knowledge of um, how training affects fitness and fatigue is uh, paramount in this. Um, so understanding the dose response relationships is essential to kind of answering some of these performance questions. And there's a tendency in research to only publish positive results. Um, but we need to know what doesn't work too, to stop us kind of wasting time and uh, spending too much time trying going down a path where uh, things may not be working. I think that a lot of that happens in practice. And I think fundamentally we have to understand that if there is no dose response relationship, the fluctuation in that dose measure or any manipulation in that dose measure to try and impact the outcome could be potentially meaningless. So for example, if we're, there's no relationship between the total amount of uh, total distance covered during a week um, and their fatigue on a Friday, then any manipulation on that isn't necessarily going to result in a manipulation in the outcome of interest at that point, which is fatigue. Um, and there's three ways that typically people are looking at these dose response relationships or have done. Um, the most work has been done on looking at the relationship between those dose measures and training outcomes, which is again something that will be the primary focus of the presentation today. There has been quite a bit of work done on the systems modeling. Um, if you want to read about systems modeling from a recent paper, it's a paper by Phil Skiba, um, which puts things into context really nicely with a useful spreadsheet that you can use. But that effectively um, originates from the work of Calvert and Bannister in the 70s and 80s. And more recently, we have machine learning approaches, which have been uh, touted for a long time now as a solution to answering these things. Um, however, I'm, I'm skeptical. Uh, there's some good work being done um, by guys like Alan Cousins and Mladen uh, has been doing some work on this. However, I do think the theoretical underpinning of the measures that have to go into the models need to be need to be correct. So what options do we have? The options that we've got is we either react to the response, whether that be a fitness test, an injury, fatigue measures, wellness scales, so on and so forth, or we try and understand what the response might be. And that takes us back to our performance question and which load measures will enable achievement of a desired response. So if we look at all the load measures that are generally used, um, and I appreciate that's not an exhaustive list on the external load uh, front, we have subjective measures, session RP, which have been really, really popular because of its ease of use. Um, then we have a number of objective heart rate methods, um, typically known as TRIMPs, and not all TRIMPs are equal, and we'll see that through some of the research that I'll present. 
And then we've got all the MEMS devices that give us distance measurements, accelerometry measurements like furloughed, uh, metabolic power in its various guises. And if we look at endurance sports, then maybe in cycling, uh, metrics like uh, the training stress score. So in terms of the current situation, we know that all load measures have limitations. And for a long time, I was kind of battling to see which one's the best. And uh, on reflection, maybe that's not uh, the best approach. Uh, but maybe the question we ask ourselves is which has which measure has the least lim limitations? We've had arguments about metabolic power apparently not being metabolic enough. Um, I think it's probably correct. There's a terminology issue there, and quite often heart rate is supposedly not as accurate as RPE um, or not as representative as RPE uh, for various reasons. And I'm going to try and kind of deconstruct that a little bit during the course of this presentation. Uh, but more importantly, I think we want to change the question. And the new question for me is what's the ability of a training load measure or measures to inform a dose response relationship because that has direct implications for programming and management applications. And also we've done some work on how training load measures can be used to provide specific information on fitness levels and fatigue. If we understand that, then we might be able to give the coach that information on their potential performance potential on a given day. Um, again, due to the brevity of this uh, slot, I'm going to be focusing on the first one, but we do have information on the second one if anybody wants to contact me afterwards. Okay, just to briefly kind of overview uh, the heart rate training load methods. There's a number of them that are quite popular. Uh, they're, they're set out there in chronological order. Uh, they differ because they either use arbitrary weightings or uh, arbitrary zones. Um, if, they, if they do use zones, so typically the formula is that the duration of the exercise is multiplied by the intensity and uh, some sort of weighting factor. So banister strength very briefly uses the mean heart rate, which is difficult to use in team sports because we get fluctuations, but the weightings are um, using the typical lactate response and they're specific to gender. Edwards Trimp, um, probably the most arbitrary measure of them all, five zones, 10% uh, wide from 50 to 100%. Weightings are one, two, three, four, and five, and there's no real specific uh, underpinning for, uh, for that weighting. Once I was teaching this stuff to a class and they asked why it was an A, B, C, D, and E, and it could very, very well be. Uh, Lucia's trim, uh, based on a three zone model, uh, the weightings are arbitrary, but at least the zones are pinned on physiological thresholds. Uh, Stagno's version of the trim um, was based on the lactate response, um, but specific only to the team. And then in 2009, uh, Vincenzo Manzi and colleagues uh, they published a couple of papers using the eye trip of the individualized trip method where the zones were non-existent in the sense that each heart rate reading was a zone um, and the blood lactate response was individual to the player. So this is the most individualized of all the methods. Then we also have section RPE. Uh, section RPE has been long used. We know the paper from 1996 that Carl Foster did and to his credit in 1996 Carl Foster looked at dose response relationships. And I've highlighted the relationships there, which show that there's a relationship 0.29 between the exercise dose measured using session RPE and uh, the fitness responses that they measured. Then in 2001, he moved to a different approach where the session RPE was related to different trip measures or a trip measure, Edwards trip in this case, um, as a method of validating session RP, and we often see the 2001 paper quoted as validation for the use of session RP. Um, Edwards Trimp was uh, in a book called The Heart Rate uh, Monitor Book by Sally Edwards, and uh, the reference page looked like this. So, what we have is a method that's potentially related to another method which we don't know much about. Then um, I guess in team sports, the main per the main kind of driver for RP use in soccer came from the paper Franco did um, with his colleagues in uh, 2005 or 2004. And they showed that most of the methods uh, showed some sort of correlation with session RP. So they looked at Lucia's trim, Edward's trim, and Bannister's trim. Um, and there's a number of other papers that in the intervening period have used a similar approach. For me, the interesting bit is that we've got to differentiate between the two methods, although they might look similar and show a relationship. Um, at times, Session RP is doing one thing, not changing, and Edward's training load is reducing. At other times, Edward's training load is increasing, 
uh, session RPE is decreasing. Um, and at other times, we see the line crosses about four peaks there in terms of Edwards train load, and the session RPE is widely different. So I think this is a uh, this is something that we've got to understand and use session RPE if we are with understanding the full uh, limitations that it also possesses. Um, of interest in the discussion of that paper, uh, this was one of the comments. Uh, the moderate correlations we found do not support this method as a valid substitute for heart rate, as only 50% of the variation in heart rate is explained by session RPE. Um, quite often, this paper is quoted as a, uh, as a basis for using session RPE in team sports, when it would seem like even the authors to some degree disagreed. Um, there are some papers that actually showed off response relationships with fitness. Uh, so this paper by Eric Gilray um, in junior soccer players um, showed a pretty strong relationship around 0.7. Um, however, the same sort of relationship was also present with just training volumes and minutes trained. So the question is, why are some studies showing relationships with session RP and others not? And my interpretation of this is that it's due to fatigue. So where you get an artificial rise in session RP due to fatigue, it's not really, really representative of the physiological strain um, on the body, um, which is the driver for adaptation. Um, it, with reference to the internal training law methods, we've published a lot of papers and other groups have published a lot of papers over the last 10 years or so, uh, looking at the individual training load method or the heart rate uh, trim method and the changes in fitness. Uh, one of the first papers in uh, team sports, following on from some of the papers that he did, uh, that Manzi and the group and his group did with runners, was um, this paper, which showed that the iTrim showed kind of very large associations with changes in various fitness measures that included the VO2 max, the ventilatory threshold, um, the speed at four millimoles, and the yo-yo test, which was at the time the uh, most prominent performance measure used in uh, team sports. Some research that we've recently done, one of my PhD students, Matt Ellis, has also um, done uh, that sort of research and we found a really strong relationship again with the changes in uh, lactate threshold one, the first lactate threshold and mean weekly atrium. Some other research that uh, one of my PhD students done, Richard Taylor, um, showed that maybe the relationship isn't as linear as we think it is. Uh, there's this notion that I've heard from a lot of practitioners that they've never seen an overtrained footballer, which may be true. Um, however, in rugby, where at a certain level, most rugby players are doing a similar sort of training, but you've got wildly different kind of physiological capabilities because of the forwards and backs, we found that we found this inverted, this theoretical inverted U uh, relationship between training and fitness, which we've always thought has existed. Um, on this occasion, it was banished to shrimp. Uh, that was that showed the strongest relationship with change in fitness. We also looked at the relationship with the external load measures. Theoretically, we wouldn't expect to see a relationship. Um, however, a lot of people do use or uh, do work in a way where they're expecting a relationship. So, apart from the very kind of high speed running above 18 uh, kilometers per hour, there weren't any relationships there between any external training or measures and change in fitness. Just wanted to show this slide as well, which showed the relationship between different metrics, um, internal and external. And as you can see, there's relationships all over the place. And this sort of approach has often been used to justify the use of an external training load measure. However, what we see from the previous slide is that just because there's a relationship between two measures doesn't mean that there's a relationship between uh, that measure and the outcome that we want to look at in this term, in, in this, uh, in this, uh, concern we're talking about fitness and the same goals for fatigue. So from this kind of data that we had in rugby um, we could calculate the turn point. Uh, we knew how much um, baluster shrimp would be required for an improvement in VO2 max or the velocity at um, four millimoles. Uh, and I guess this raises questions about philosophical underpinnings of performance systems. Um, there's been some talk of using a minimal effective dose and I think this might be useful where a majority of that minimal effective dose can be gained from a game and then you top it up with the technical training the coach might do and if anything's left over then we might do some of the physical performance stuff that we might do as practitioners and this helps to maintain freshness especially when you're playing frequently. 
and then there's also the other approach that people talk about where they talk about um, the maximal dose that can be managed in robustness. Um, and I think this is physiologic, this is a, a philosophical standpoint that practitioners may take or may have to choose between and maybe even at different times of the season. Um, if we know that training load or the training dose also contributes to fatigue, then do we necessarily want them want to push them to this maximal dose that can be managed if it's a proving fatigue? Um, and what is this definition of robustness? Is it what they can maximally achieve without breaking down, or is it what they can maximally achieve without uh, showing signs of fatigue and being able to fully recover? And I guess that's a little bit up in the air at the moment. Some more uh, data this time from Hurling and the work that. Was, uh, you know, really ought to be kind of involved with with Shane Malone and Kieran Collins over in Ireland, and this is probably one of the most comprehensive studies um, on these dose response relations, simply because of the number of players that were able to get involved, um, study period, um, and also the number of performance physiological measures. And you can see from this table here that it's mainly the iTRIP method that actually relates to most of the physiological adaptations that we're looking for. Um, Banished shrimp also shows up trumps in some some instances. Um, but we can see on the left-hand side that session RP doesn't show anything at all, uh, or very little. Um, if we take uh, a couple of them, a uh, couple of the measures there. So on the left-hand side, we've got um, the relationship between all the different load measures, and what I believe was um, the first threshold, and on the right-hand side, the second threshold. Um, then we see that. ITRIM really does give us some certainty about the desired outcome that we might be planning for. Um, and the other TRIMP methods, even though they're heart rate based, sometimes don't give us the same information. So not all TRIMPs are equal. A lot of the time when we talk about heart rate exertion, um, everything's clumped into one. Um, some more data this time from competitive cyclists. Um, again, similar sort of study design with a training period. We looked at the dose response relationships between various dose measures at the top there. So we've got session RP on the left, um, training stress score on the right hand side there as well. Um, we find that across the measures, fitness and performance. So at the bottom there, we've got the power output at, during a eight minute all out test, which is something that we developed and we looked at the reliability of or something that could be done quite often by, uh, by cyclists in the field um, and in the lab. Um, we find that ITRIMP relates best with them all, um, but there are other measures that actually show decent relationships. Um, and this time, the session RP actually uh, shows relationship that some practitioners may consider uh, useful. Um, I will throw a caveat in there that because um, this was during like a pre-season uh, base building period, um, this training would have been quite kind of long and slow zone one base building sort of training with very little high intensity stuff. So uh, that might have influenced the results. And just because it shows relationships in this scenario during uh, this period where they're doing fairly controlled work, it may not when they enter the season. Maybe just to, just to put my caveat in one minute, if that's all right, please. Sorry, what was that, Steve? Sorry, just for my caveat in one minute, please, if that's okay. Okay. Cheers. More to continue, Steve? Maybe. Yeah, carry on, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. So um, how can we work practically with this information? So we could, on a group level, identify what kind of load level would potentially decrease fitness, what could potentially be used for a maintenance of fitness, and what could be used for an improvement in fitness. Obviously, you can see from the graph there, there's a lot of variation, but this is the first part of the process. And then over the longer term, we would refine it for each individual by assessing if that prescribed load actually indeed did improve performance or not, and whether we need to change it and become a bit more accurate so that we can get the desired response that we want. Um, so just to summarize on ITRIM, we've shown that it shows dose response relationships in running, in soccer, in cycling, in rugby, in hurling, um, and we've compared it to other methods which don't necessarily show these relationships. Um, there is a paper that I didn't get a chance to go into by LAMO in kind of clinical situations which compared continuous kind of protocols versus intermittent protocols that show that whatever the intensity of the work, as long as the match score is matched, then the training response was also similar. And there's also work um, from Manzi and colleagues that shows there's relationships with ITRIP and heart rate variability. 
So the question I've got to ask is, when you're looking for a desired response, is this what you want from a training law measure? Um, we do have a bit of a conundrum. There's lots of different types of activity that we do. Um, and we have to go through this process for each sport in each scenario. So just because this research has shown, uh, the research that we've done has shown things in certain aspects of certain sports, doesn't necessarily mean it's the correct uh, process for your sport. Um, the questions we've got to ask is which dose measure for which response. So it might be fatigue that we're looking at, and that might change the question and change the load measures that are of interest. We actually know that it does for some instances, for some of the research that we've done, and which scenario. We know that some of this is affected by going from pre-season to in-season. So in summary, um, I guess the information that presented today hopefully demonstrates why I think understanding the dose-response relationship is essential. Um, we found consistent results with eye trim across different sports. Subjective may be cheap and easy, but does it give you certainty? Uh, we're dealing with Ferraris. Um, do we use diesel? I guess is the question. And we've got a follow-up process where we start off reactive to become proactive. And this process may take a, a period of time. Um, and being proactive means developing this understanding of how to achieve the desired response. So in terms of the performance question of how much is enough to maintain fitness and how much is required for, uh, required for improvement of fitness, um, we've kind of gone some way to answering those. Um, the other two questions we've done some work on, but I wasn't able to present the data today. But again, like I said, I'm happy to do a follow-up um, at a later date. 2D Technology, um, some of the guys that have done the real hard work behind this. Um, so Shane Malolo and Kieran Collins over in Ireland, um, they, you know, uh, it's not easy to do this sort of research. Uh, I can understand why people wanted to take one load measure compared to the other when they've collected lots and lots of data. But to try and get some of the testing in between to look at the dose response relationship is not easy at all. Dario Sanders has spent hours and hours over in um, Holland on his own collecting some of his data with the cyclists. Uh, Matt, uh, who's provided some of the data there, he's currently doing his PhD and we're really looking at some of the earlier work I did in football to make it a bit more comprehensive. Um, and Richard Taylor, who's also uh, done a hell of a lot of uh, work over the last couple of years and now finished his PhD in rugby, and you'll see a lot more of this data coming out uh, in the coming year, I hope. Um, if you have any questions, you can hit me up on Training Impulse on Twitter. Uh, my email address is there as well. And I'd just like to point out, like Steve did earlier, that there are bigger issues at hand. Um, 